Alright guys, so I'm going to give you some background. I live in a neighborhood called, Ab called Abu Tor. Half the neighborhood is Arab. If you walk down that the street and walk down that hill, it's an Arab neighborhood. So today is Yom Yushalayim. Yeah, as you can see, there's all these school kids and and they came from far and wide. Dati Lumi, settler kids, and they're here to celebrate Jerusalem Day. So there was another group that just walked by about a minute ago. Kids in all white with an Israeli flag. And they were singing, you know, about this land, about Jerusalem, you know, great songs. And then a lady from across, oh, there we go. These, these two ladies that just came out. So another lady from the same building just came out and started screaming at these kids like, you're making provocations, you know, this is an Arab, half of this neighborhood is Arab, you're making provocations, ta 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 ta. I yelled back at them and I said, you're the one making provocations to the lady. I'm like, you don't, you want to be scared? Go back to Poland. You know, you want to run and run scared? We're home. Yeah. And this woman, so our neighbor down here, she's from Yemen, she's from, her family's from Aden, Yemen, I'm sorry, Kurdistan, she came here years ago and she's, she's like, no, let the kids walk, let the kids sing, whatever, you know? So we had, kind of have this weird juxtaposition here. We have some people in this neighborhood of secular, I guess, lefty, some people here religious, some people, and then we have down the hill, we have Arabs. And then we have these kids who are celebrating Yom Yerushalayim. <laughs> and they're going to celebrate. Oh, there they go. So now they're going towards the Arab part, which I hope they'll be safe. I hope I'm not going to hear any reports. Uh, yeah, but uh, I was going to do this broadcast later, but I guess I could start now. I guess I could start now. So, my friends. We have a very special day. Today is a very special day, as I mentioned to you guys just now. Today is Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, today is also Mother's Day, for those of you celebrating. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, to my mom, my grandmother. Um, and today is also a very interesting day juxtaposition with Yom Yerushalayim, which is Victory Day. So yesterday, which was May 8th, was Victory in Europe Day, which is the, the day that the Germans surrendered to the Americans, or the day that the Americans commemorate the victory in Europe. And today, May 9th, is in Russian what's called Dien Pabiede, or Victory Day for the Soviet Army, in which the day in which the Germans surrendered, the Nazis surrendered to the Soviet Army. And my friends, you know, I'm, I must have told the story to you guys many times, but in case I didn't, I'll tell it to you today. My friend Phil says Dien Pabiede, Dien Pabiede. And um, it's actually connected it's actually connected to Yom Yerushalayim. And it's interesting that, if, that this year it falls out, essentially, Victory Day, or Soviet Victory Day, falls out on Erev Yom Yerushalayim, on May 9th. Uh, I'll just tell you guys straight up, the only reason I'm alive is because of Victory Day in the USSR. I mean, you could say a lot of people, a lot of Soviet Jews, the only reason they're alive is because of that. But I'll just tell you guys, you know, uh, most people don't realize, most, at least most people in the former Soviet Union don't realize that 250,000 Jewish men and women uh, fought for the Soviet army in World War II. There is a joke, a running joke, among anti-Semites in the former Soviet Union. You know, they'll ask, where did the Jews uh, fight in World War II? They'll say, in Uzbekistan. What does that mean, Uzbekistan? Was that one of the fronts? No, Uzbekistan. They like to say it, um, that because Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan were two of the places where Jews were evacuated to. Primarily women and children were evacuated to from places like Ukraine and Belarus and other places that were on the front. For example, my grandmother, Bo Hashem, who's alive today, she was 11 years old and she was evacuated to, I think, I believe, Tashkent. 
Uzbekistan. That's why if you meet, you can meet a lot of Ashkenazi Jews uh, from the former Soviet Union who were actually born in Tashkent. Does it mean that they are Buharian? No, it just means that they were born in Tashkent. That their family stayed in Tashkent after the evacuation, that's where they were born. But contrary to what, so, uh, to what anti-Semites will tell you, 250,000, about a quarter million, maybe more, Jews served in the Soviet army in World War II. My grandfather, Tzvi Hirsch, uh, Ben Yankov Pinchas, was one of those people. He was a mil an army supply. He was essentially, his rank was technically, and I'll tell you guys a story about that, his rank was technically uh, colonel, which was for army supply, was eff effectively the equivalent of being a general, uh, which for a Jew, I mean, I don't want to say rare, but not many Jews got to that level. Um, so he had an interesting story. He was born in a place called Berdichev, which is known for the Hasidic, I guess, it's not even a dynasty at this point, because there is no there was no dynasty that came from it for, for Levi Yitzhak and Berdichev. So my grandfather was a religious person for lack of a better term until, term until he was 12 years old. Um, so he, before he met my grandmother, whom he met after the war, he had a first wife uh, whom he had a child with, and she had another child on the way. And my grandfather came back, and he tried to convince his wife and also my great-grandfather to leave Berdichev. And my great-grandfather told him, listen, I have a business here, you have the orders, and I got to do what I got to do. And they stayed, and they ended up being liquidated by actually the Ukrainians who, you know, as we say in Russian, went ahead of the train or went ahead of the, uh, you know, the, um, the locomotive, as it were, quicker than the Nazis ever could to, to do what they did to the Jews. So my grandfather, after having survived, you know, Stalingrad and, and all kinds of hell and bombing and different things, uh, as well as being a POW twice. So in his case, being a POW, which meant being in what's called encirclement when the Nazis would capture units or giant, you know, companies, they would, they would basically create a makeshift POW camp around them with barbed wire. So in the case of my grandfather, he was a Jew, a, an officer, and a member, card-carrying mem card member of the Communist Party. Excuse me, guys, I'm parched here. It's very hot here in Jerusalem. <clears throat> so that was basically a triple whammy against him to where he would not even be taken as a prisoner, he would not even be interrogated because they knew that a Jew would never, whatever country he was fighting for, army he was fighting for, he would never give information. So all you do with that person is you shoot him in the head. So my grandfather made a calculation twice and he said, you know, if I stay, they shoot me. If I run, they could either shoot me or I could survive and go into, you know, the forest and get back into, uh, you know, into, uh, with some other unit or whatever it is. Uh, so he did that twice. He did that twice. He survived the war. After the war, he came back to Berdichev. Someone uh, pointed out the Ukrainian policeman who, who gave the order to liquidate all the Jews including his now deceased wife, including my great-grandfather, including the children. He found that policeman, he took his officer's gun, my grandfather, and he shot the guy on the spot. No judge, no jury, no tribunal, nothing. Just shot the guy on the spot. For that, he was not sent to any camp. He was not sent anywhere. He was not imprisoned. He was merely demoted from colonel to lieutenant. Um, my father, interestingly enough, when he was applying to leave the Soviet Union and he was looking through family documents, you know, he knew my grandfather as a uh, colonel because they would, you know, he would go to the beach, let's say, some public place, and they would yell out Colonel Lifshitz, Polkovnik in Russia. And then when my father saw this document that said lieutenant, when he was applying to leave in the late 70s, he was just perplexed. He's like, what lieutenant? And he and he carried this question with him until he finally met a relative of ours 
who was, I guess, a contemporary of my grandfather, who was the wife of my grandfather's cousin or uncle, I believe it was. And she told this, this is the story that I just told you guys. She told this story to my father in the year 2009. I'm sorry, in the year 2000, not nine, 2011. I told the story. And my father finally, you know, he was like shocked. And then he finally realized why my grandfather on his documents, it said lieutenant, because he actually was demoted to lieutenant for what he had done. So my friends, uh, interesting juxtaposition between the, that day of commemoration, that Memorial Day, May 9th, or today, with Yom Yerushalayim, because now you look at history, you look at the trajectory of history. We defeated, you know, with the help of 250,000 Jews, some of whom dreamed to get to the land of Israel, the shores, the shores of the land that I'm sitting in right now. You know, 20 minutes behind me is the walk is is the old city, where last night, unfortunately, our cousins decided to make a nice party, a nice minyan for Ramadan. I hope I, I always say, you know, I wonder how the kiddush was this morning, <laughs> but um, you know, and they defeated what was, I guess, the modern incarnation of Amalek. You know, I was just talking to my mother. And she showed me a picture of how U.S. Fo forces captured the 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 layer of I guess Goebbels, and they set up a a Purim, uh, you know, a Megillah reading and davening and a Suda in the offices of Goebbels after it was captured, and and uh, how incredible it was. And I and, and we both agreed that we think that the Nazis knew who they were. What their role was in, in in history, they knew that they were the modern incarnation of Amalek. They knew who they were, and so it was only fitting that we help to defeat this modern incarnation of Amalek. We still have Amalek to some extent in this world. We don't know who exactly it is. We can speculate, but we're not going to talk about that right now. The point is then. So then, you know, three years later, we had. The state of Israel, not to say that there weren't Jews here before that, there was a whole movement to build a state, infrastructure, uh, political apparatuses happening for 60 years before that, but finally we, the state was created in 1948, and then 22 years after Victory Day in the Soviet Union, before the Soviet Union, we had the Jewish people, some of whom actually fought in that war, who now lived here, saw with their own eyes the liberation of Yerushalayim from Jordanian hands. They did know they were Amalek. Like, yeah, they did. They did. Even Hitler said, you know, it's either, it, 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 he said something like, I'm paraphrasing, that the entire history is between the, the German and the Jew, and something like the two cannot coexist. But he, he wasn't really talking about the German per se, the German uh, ethnicity. He was talking about he really would even, it was code for Amalek. The entirety of the existence is Amalek versus the Jew. And that is, has been the battle of, of thousands of years of history. You know, whether you're talking about the Spanish Inquisition or Crusades, other, other peoples who came along just to wipe us out just because, you know, just because of who we are. Because we could, they cannot coexist with us on the same planet. It's just not feasible for them. Um, Julius Stryker, yeah, I mentioned that to my mother. Julius Stryker, you want to show Yale Purim Fest 1946? Yes, when he went to the Gals. Exactly, exactly. I, this is something I mentioned as well. They knew, they knew who they were. They knew what their job was and they realized that they lost. It's interesting that they, they didn't realize that they were, they were bound to lose after a very bloody and, and tough struggle. They, they didn't realize, they always think that, that's the thing with Amalek, he always thinks he's going to win. Just so you guys have to remember, Amalek is the gematria of Sofek, which is doubt. And whenever you guys have a doubt in your life, or any kind of, you know, negative thoughts, and, you know, you see something in front of you, and you're saying, well, this is not going to work out. That's, you have to re remind yourself that at the end of the day, this force is not going to win. It may be very powerful, it may be very strong, it may fight you to, to the last moment, tooth and nail. You know, I was just talking to a friend of mine about business, and my friend told me, you know, my friend is Yemenite, so we're talking about our own mutual businesses, and you guys know I have a wine business, and there's some challenges there, and my friend has his business in the States, he has challenges, and he tells me, you know, man, he goes to me, he's like, 
he's like, Tzvi, from the bottom of my, of, of my Yemenite heart, please, I beg of you, don't quit, don't give up. He goes to me, um, you know, you have to fight until the last drop of blood. And what Amalek, or Sofek, doubt, doesn't understand, it never understands it, is that it, it ultimately will not win. It ultimately will not win. Um, so that's it. So I'll just tell you guys, I mean, for those of you guys who missed it, like, I was just out here on the balcony, and this group of, you know, Dati Lumi kids, these, like, settler kids just walked by with those early flags, and they were yelling out, you know, singing songs about Jerusalem Day and all kinds of nationalist songs. And, and so a lady comes out across from the building across. Someone's, someone's calling me. All right. Anyway, somebody across. Sorry about that, guys. Just getting a call in between. Um, there's got to be a way to, like, I guess it's just going airplane mode next time. But anyway, so this lady across the building across, you know, so our, our neighborhood is very diverse. It's got, like, secular people. It's got film, you know, it's film people. It's got Arabs. And so this lady across comes out and says, She's yelling at these guys, you guys are making a provocation, you know that the, half this neighborhood is Arab, over there are Arabs, you're making a provocation, this is a provocation, you know, you saw what just happened yesterday, da 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 And I yell across to this lady, I'm like, you're the one making a provocation right now, you're the one screaming. You know, if you want to sit and cower and hide, pack your bags and go home to Poland, or I don't know where her family's from, Hungary. I don't, I'm like, why are we here? You know, what, 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 what to sit and cower bef before our neighbors? Before our cousins or what? Like, what, what, are we, what are we here for? What are, we, what are we doing here, really? And that's the that's the struggle, my friends. That's really, that's actually the internal struggle within our people. Before we can we can figure out how to, you know, win the struggle against our enemies or against our neighbors, we have to figure out ourselves internally. Because apparently, you know, you guys see the coalitions. My friend just sent me a whole thing. You know, they're gonna make a government with like Lapid Mikaeli, you know, Mirab Mikaeli, who's the granddaughter of Kastner. And this other guy from Meretz, and, this, and I said, listen, eh, they'll make a government with them, they're not going to give them any power. But just the fact that we're even making a government with these people, just the fact we're making a government with the Arabs, you know. And I always say, some friends of mine also echoed this, they said, you know, Rabbi Kahana sitting up in Shemayim, cynically, I don't know if he's laughing or crying. You know, what is he, do, what is he going to do first? He's going to cry, he's going to laugh, like, what, what, what are we doing here? What, what, what have we devolved into? <laughs> But, with that said, guys, it's a very, very special day. It's a very special day for me, and I guess in my family. And uh, I always say, you know, in my family, I'm, I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but I'm just saying as, a, as to illustrate a, paint a picture, illustrate a point, that I'm basically the first person in my family to take that step, to make that leap, to make Aliyah, to actualize the dreams of... You know, that my grandfather, the one who fought in World War II, had that his, 100% I know for a fact that his father, my great-grandfather, Yankov Pintas, had in Berdichev that he davened for every single solitary day, you know. Um, so, Baruch Hashem, it's a very special day. It's a very special day. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, why, why are people celebrating the victory of the Soviet army, da, da, da. It's not so much, you know, the Soviet army was an entity that Hashem used at that time to achieve a goal um, in history, to, to push trajectory of, the trajectory of history forward. If it wouldn't be the Soviet army, it would be somebody else. Yeah, American army as well, but the Soviets really, you know, it's interesting. I, I remember being, you know, learning about World War II. You always learn about World War II as an American student, only from primarily the American side. You learn about a little bit of Warsaw Pact here and there. You don't actually learn about the battles, except maybe the Battle of the Bulge. We learn, again, these are things that are glossed over in, in school, in high school. Maybe you can learn them in college, but we, I just never, you know, the only, the only knowledge I have of the Soviet side of World War II was from my parents. It was from parents, was from, grand, you know, my grandmother's, my, my other grandmother of lesser memory, she just recently passed away. She was 96 years old. I was there in the States for her funeral, and... She was a nurse on the front. She was, you know, that's how she met my grandfather. And my grandfather, by the way, I'm going to let you guys a little secret, and, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll close it out with this. And, um, you know, my grandfather met my grandmother, I guess it was his second wife, he met after the war, and he met her when he was 39, and she was 21, I believe. And they married, 
they married essentially when he was 40 and she was 22. But you could say, you know, at that time, everybody was essentially an adult. You know, today you look at 22-year-old people, no offense to anybody watching, 22. A bunch of kids, really, but 22 at that time was already, you know, you lived a few lifetimes. 40 was, forget it. It was a person who, you know, can tell you some stories. So they married, and, um, you know, it's interesting. I look at my own life, relatively speaking, I never went through a war, granted, but that's, I've had my own challenges, and I was named after my aunt, grandfather, and I'm 40. <laughs> I'm a very, according to my friend, I'm a very well-preserved 40, like a Cabernet Sauvignon. So, um, somebody told me, listen, if, if, you're, if you're given the name after a person like that who had a, such a life, you know, maybe, may not have been such a good idea. So what I decided to do was to, right before I came back here, I was decided to add a name, and the name that I chose was Moshe. I don't know why I chose it, it just came to me. And then later I found out that Moshe has the same gematria as, the, as uh, Shiloh, which is incidentally enough a winery that I've been wor doing, working with and doing marketing for for the past year. Where the Mishkan is, where the tabernacle is, uh, all these kind of things. And that equates to... Uh, both of those names equate to Moshiach, not to say that I'm Moshiach, in any sense of the imagination. Guys, like, just, you know, forget about that. But it's, it's just interesting that I chose that name and that I work with Shiloh. And, um, you know, they say there's a few things that could change your mazal. One is name, one is location, you know, change your makam, change your mazal, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, today's a very special day. Today, it's interesting that they fell out, that these names, uh, that these uh, days of commemoration fell out on the same day. But it's interesting how the people always say that we, in Israel, you know, we go from Yom HaZikaron, Memorial Day, to right into Yom Atzmaut, right? So this year, we're going from Victory Day, or Din Pabiyadi, right into Yom Yerushalayim. And most, again, most people think that there's no, there's no connections, but there, there, again, if you look at history, if you look at Jewish history, world history, there's definitely connections, you know. Uh, we defeated Hitler, the Soviets defeated Hitler on, on this day, and then uh, 22 years later, you got, uh, you know, a portal that opened up in 1967, and um, the world was never the same since. And that's a whole other discussion, a whole other sheer. If you guys want to listen to something, uh, kind of a primer to that, you guys should go look up Yom Tov Glazer, 1967 on YouTube, and he talks about all the things that happened uh, in 1967, and what it meant for the world, really, and what was happening in America, and around the world, you know, the whole counter, not just counterculture, but the whole kind of movement of uh, spirituality, and also the Baal Shuvah movement happened on the, on, at, at that time. People started coming back to Hashem, the Jews who were disconnected started coming back to Hashem. And, um, but yeah, guys, today is a special day. And, uh, without Hashem, we should have another day that we can connect to the third day that will connect to the other, the first two days, which is Victory Day and Yom Yerushalayim. And, uh, hopefully there'll be a third day when Mashiach will arrive, and we'll, we will understand what all of this was for, what all of these, quote-unquote, as the lady across from me screamed, provocations were for, and all of these battles. And as my Yemenite friend said, do not give up until the last moment. Do not. All right, guys. Happy Victory Day. Happy Jerusalem Day. And I'll talk to you soon.